Today, we're at least breaking the first two rules. Welcome back to Hive Mind Unlimited. And welcome to How Did It Age, our movie segment where we rewatch old movies and evaluate them with modern context. Today's movie is Fight Club. This movie came out in 1999, directed by David Fincher, and stars Brad Pitt, Edward Norton, and Helena Bonham Carter. Don't forget Meatloaf and Jared Leto. Yeah, no movie is complete without Jared Leto and Meatloaf. <laughs> I love Meatloaf's boobies. <laughs> Me too. Heavy emphasis with this one. If you haven't seen it, there are going to be a lot of spoilers. So please, if you haven't seen it, go watch it and then come back to this video. And before we start, can you do something for me? What's that? Can you hit me as hard as you can? <laughs> what? I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Why would I do that? Hey, who are you talking to? What? No, no one? Are we doing this video? Yeah, yeah, I kind of got started without you. Without me? What? Uh, Let's just jump in. I, I... Okay, just get in here. All right. That's, yeah, that's my bad. Started without me? I haven't been sleeping that's very that... well. Hmm. You never started a video without me. <laughs> that's... It sounded like you were talking to somebody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, anyway, Fight Club, right? It's Fight Club? Yeah. That's what we're talking about? Should I beat my ass in front of you and frame you? What? <laughs> Did we watch the same movie? I think so. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Let's get into it. <laughs> Let's get into it. Well, Riley, have you seen this film before? Of course, I saw it a lot in high school and college, but it had been some years since I had seen it. It had been some time for me as well, and now, knowing some more context, wow, wow, we wow. When this movie first came out, it was not a major success by any means. Not really a flop, but it underperformed. It was 101.2 million against a 63, 65 million dollar budget, mm -hmm. which was really, really stretched. Originally, it was set to be a 28 million dollar movie, Brad Pitt the amount of sets they wanted combined with like this really elaborate and rather sloppy ad campaign that they brought in at the very end to try and market it properly kind of all led to its flop of a opening couple weekends. Some other interesting things about this movie as it came to be Russell Crowe was sought after for Brad Pitt's character, Tyler and Matt Damon and Sean Penn were on like the top list for Ed Norton. I could totally see Sean Penn. Matt Damon is difficult for me to see in this I movie. See, I see Matt Damon a little more easily because he's like the soft, I don't know. Sean Penn to me is like too tough. But he's also kind of squirrely and weird the yeah. same way Edward Norton is. One of the funniest casting notes here is that Fincher pitched Marla to Julia Louis-Dreyfus. That's crazy. <laughs> just like. I cannot imagine. After seeing her in like Veep and just like obviously after Seinfeld, I can't see her with like ruffled hair, crack whore energy. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see that. The studio really wanted Reese Witherspoon. Fincher thought she was too young. Wow. That would have been really weird. Yeah. Um, they eventually landed and chose Carter based on her performance in Wings of a Dove, which I've never seen. I've never seen that either. Either way, I think casting wise, this movie hits on like another level. It was the toughest recast I've ever done in I this didn't series. Do one. Yeah, it was difficult. Yeah, I like barely did one. I did an idea and I didn't even want to do it because it's just like, yeah, I'll get into how fucking good I think this movie is. Yeah. But it's gonna be hard to reimagine it or recontextualize it. Some other fun notes, uh, Fincher approached Tom York for the soundtrack, mm -hmm. which I thought was awesome. He really wanted someone that had never done a traditional movie score to do this, to kind of add to the, weirdness of it I guess like yeah. Fincher's down to the last detail guy and all those things are so calculated he ends up going with the Dust Brothers who were like a breakbeat production duo who produced Mbop by Hanson and that is like a grimy kind of horror <laughs> yeah 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 classic garage euro track <laughs> it was so weird when I looked that up and and like when I looked up Dust Brothers because yeah. I feel like I'd heard the name but I don't know their music mm. and 
I was like, who did this soundtrack? Because it is that kind of like English garage. It's super like propulsive. Yeah. Reminds me of later Fincher movies and stuff. Yeah. But then like they do that, but they also produced Mbop, which is just a boy band pop hit. Just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, over time, this has become one of the signature cult classics. Going to make a lot of top 50, top 25, top 10 movies of all time list. Yeah. And so the reviews have adjusted for that. New York Times said it's the quintessential cult movie of the 90s. It's sitting at an 8.8 .8 on IMDb, an 80% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 4.3 on Letterboxd, and our guy Raj hated it. He gave it two out of four stars, calling it visceral and hard edge, but also a thrill ride masquerading as philosophy, whose promising first act is followed by a second that panders to macho sensibilities, and a third he dismissed as trickery. Wow. Yeah. I kind of like that. I like it too. I like that as a review of this movie because yeah. I understand some of the qualms. Yeah, and I understand that me as like not a genuine film buff or like someone who can dissect a film to the levels of the goat, I can easily fall victim to some trickery and some like cheaper kind of masculine macho things in a uh -huh. movie. I mean, some of my favorite movies of all, like Sicario is one of my favorite movies of all time. That definitely does that. Mm -hmm. uh, Full Metal Jacket's one of my favorite movies of all time. That definitely does that. This movie falls in there. That definitely does that. So, I mean, I like it as an analysis, but fuck me sideways. I love this movie to death. And I love <laughs> it more now than I ever have after this rewatch. One thing that we talked about off camera that I think is important for the viewer watching this right now is did you know the twist before you watched the movie the first time? Yeah, I don't remember specifically, but I'm pretty sure I did. Right. I think I went in as a teenager, which this happened all the time for me. I think my sister saw it. Mm -hmm. said you gotta see this movie Brad Pitt's fake <laughs> or like right, something right, like right, that right. like she led with the twist yeah because I was probably at an age I think when I first saw it she often did that to like help me I think like uh -huh. instead of like just go into this this guy's fake you'll like the fighting and then you'll figure it out later why you love the movie right kind of deal and so i I have like a rough memory of going in already being at least teed off on the twist. See, I had the opposite experience. When I was in high school, I was dating a girl my senior year who mm -hmm. like showed me, I guess, uh, showed me like 10 movies that are like quintessential to me, like figuring, okay, figuring out movies that I really, really liked. And she purposefully kept me in the dark nice. about the twist of the movie. So I got to like, F stop doing that. <laughs> it wasn't a great relationship. It wasn't. Not, uh, thanks for the movies, though. But <laughs> um, not the only thing she gave me, you know what I mean, <laughs> in terms of trauma. All right. But I did not know, and I watched it with her, and she knew the whole time. And yeah. I very much do respect that she did not, like, even the glances, you yeah. know, like, Ooh, like that's a hint, you know, like stuff like that. Yeah. Like You're that. Looking. This yeah. Part's important. yeah. Not, not any of that. Yeah. I really got to like experience it all the way. Yeah. And I will say watching it, like if you can watch it without the twist, which I know you shouldn't be watching our video <laughs> right. by this yeah. point, if you don't know that yeah. it's better that way, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because figuring it out is really gratifying. Yeah. And it's a really interesting experience to watch this movie and be wondering exactly what is going yeah. on. And then you figure it out before they tell you which I do yeah. like. I don't like when it's just spoon fed to you. And so they kind of like let you know, Yeah. but they make you feel a little smart for figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And then they end up telling you. And it ends open ended enough that there are still interpretations to be had. And totally. I'll get into one of mine later. But I think if you made it this far in the f this video and if you've seen it, I think the note to take home there is if you go to recommend this to a friend or you bring this to a movie night with your friends and some of them haven't seen it, Hold your horses. Like yeah. let them let it let it happen to them as it happened to you, hopefully. This movie is based off the 96 novel by Chuck Palinuk. Mm -hmm. Is that how you'd say it? Palinuk? I don't know how to say it. Palinuki? <laughs> I've never read it. <laughs> never read it. <laughs> okay, right. whatever. <laughs> Now, this movie has a lot of lines that are like, it's like Roger said, it's supposed to be philosophical in a yes. certain way. And a lot of the actual dialogue is taken from the book. Like, it's pretty much word for word. Yeah. Most of the dialogue is exactly what the book is. But 
some of it's really funny and some of it is like a little highfalutin, a little like trying to give you some philosophy about the world yeah. through the lens of like very chaotic, mentally ill characters. I think when there, it gets to a point where it turns heady, where like I make the decision that like, oh, it's like pathetic philosophy. It's like when you're really fucked up friend is trying to explain life to you. And you're like, oh yeah, buddy, like you got it. You figured out all the answers. And a lot of it is rationalizing their own failures. Right. So much of that is it's dirtbag philosophy. It's kind of like the reason I'm not this, this or this is because of the failure of society. And yeah. all of it is actually meaningless. And I think there is some power in that, especially when you find this movie in your youth, it's yeah. like, a lot of those, those that angst can come through a lot of this philosophy, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting about the book is supposed to, the main character is supposed to be like in his forties. Yeah. And in the movie, it's like, he's 30 years old. Yeah. It's almost like in your twenties, if you think this way, you're just figuring it out and you're angsty. Mm -hmm. And if you're in your forties, you had a psychotic break. Yeah. So that's a huge part of it. I think like scenes and lines are going to get rather warbled here because I have a lot of lines that lace my scenes and whatever. But yeah. I think a good line that's one of my favorites that kind of exemplifies that point is early on when Ed Norton, who's a nameless character, he's just our narrator here, you never get his name, figures out his way to fall asleep is to go to all these help groups. Yeah. Um, and he's going to testicular cancer, blood cancer, brain, whatever, all these people, all these groups. And it's like the, the emotions of others are allowing him to feel emotions that he is void of. And then he's allowed to sleep. And then when Marla enters, he is like pissed and grossed out by her that she's doing the same thing, that she's being a tourist. She's a faker. Yeah. yeah. That she's a tourist and his line of her lie reflected my lie and suddenly I couldn't feel anything. And so it's like when he is confronted with his own mistakes or whatever, his own problems that are helping him or his rationalizing, like you said, then he can't feel anything. He doesn't get to like cheat himself anymore when there's the reflection right there. Yeah. And that's a line like I never really picked I, obviously I heard it before, but I realized like it's importance this time. And then that like, obviously that sparks their relationship. A lot of my lines are these Tyler Durden lines kind of philosophizing to Edward Norton's character, which is so funny because it's internal dialogue right. at the end of the day. Some of my favorites of those are on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone drops to zero. <laughs> yeah, It's just thinking like, it's such a dumb realization but it's it's said yeah. in this grandiose way. Yeah, that, it's said like he's a scientist. Like, yeah. oh, here's the calculations, and if you live long enough, your your survival rate is zero. It's, it's just like, it's you could literally say everyone dies. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's the yeah. whole sentence. And then I also love uh, in the scene where Tyler is chemical burning Edward Norton's hand mm -hmm. to show him what like real pain is, and like like make him confront pain and all of these things. He says. Our fathers were our models for God. If our fathers bailed, what does that tell you about God? <laughs> yeah. He's like, you have to seriously consider the possibility that God might hate you. Yes. So it's like that whole tense moment. That's one of the best scenes in the movie, in my opinion, because it's so intense. And then you get to see it from the other side later on. You see that Edward Norton is just doing this to himself. Yeah. And it's just a crazy person. Well, and that's kind of the turning point into Project Mayhem, too. Yeah. He, like, finally sheds everything he learns from the groups. And, like, he tries to go into his emotional cave, his guided meditation in that scene. He's like, fuck that. Fuck that. Stay here. Stay with me now. Shedding that, like, softness of what helped him in the past and just, like, focusing on like the disgusting pain and like evil awfulness then that goes into Project Mayhem kind of. And there is kind of this underlying narrative the whole time that is like, it's like a hatred for self-improvement yeah. And instead choosing self-destruction. Yeah. That's one of my favorite Tyler lines is self-improvement is masturbation. Yeah. And then self self-destruction is something else. But I just love that because he's talking about going to the gym and he's like, yeah, self-improvement is masturbation. And like, I love that he's looking at like a, like a Gucci underwear model yeah. or something on the bus and says like, why, like that's not a real man. Yeah. A guy who looks like that is not a real man. And it's hilarious that like a minute later, Brad Pitt is fighting shirtless and looks exactly like looks that. Looks awesome. Like he's <laughs> like, he is exactly what yeah. they're talking about, which also kind of, it helps that you realize that like, Edward Norton doesn't really look like that in this movie, at least. Right. He's imagining that. And he's yeah. imagining Brad Pitt as like the things he wishes he could be, yeah. but also hating on those exact same things when they're outside of the context of his own mind. Mm -hmm. I love early on when he's in the cancer 
meeting and Chloe walks up mm-hmm. and the in his the narration says, Chloe looks like Meryl Streep's skeleton would look like if you made it smile and walk around the party being extra nice to people. That line is just ridiculous. And Chloe's up there saying that all she wants to do before she dies get is fucked. get fucked. Yeah. She's like, I just want to get laid one last time. She's got, she's like, I, I got have, lube. I, I got the pornographic porn. movies. <laughs> They're like, all right, Chloe. They're They're like, all right, Chloe. Yeah. Early philosophical headlines, losing all hope is freedom. And then in his first embrace with Bob, they say the mantra of that one that says, yes, we are men. Men are what we are. I love that. Just early on as he's hugging like the big breasted meatloaf there. Yeah. I do really want to talk about Marla's famous line from this movie because I have some context for it. Okay. Yeah. So so Tyler is talking about how he is hooking up with Marla and talks about all like the nasty things that she says, things yep. he can't believe. Yeah, he like walks down to the kitchen and is like, you got some crazy friends, man. <laughs> yeah. And then he it cuts to just a quick scene, a flashback to Tyler mm-hmm. and Marla sleeping together, and Marla rolls off of him and says, I haven't been fucked like that since grade school. That's the line that she said. It's a very like contentious line in the discussion of this movie. Apparently, the original script for this movie, she doesn't say that. Instead, she rolls off of him and says, I want to have your abortion. Also, the funny thing about that is in the DVD commentary of this movie, Helena Bonham Carter, they're talking about that line being so disgusting, the 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 actual line, yeah. the, I haven't been fucked like that since grade school. And she's from the UK yeah. and said she did not know what that line meant. Because oh. she didn't know what grade school was. Right, it's just primary or So she thought yeah. maybe it was high school yeah. or something. And then when she found out, she was like, oh my God, <laughs> like that is a horrible line. I think as horrible it is, as it is though, it's like, it's perfect. It sets the tone yeah. of depravity and like the house is so gross, like whatever. It's down to every detail there. And the fact that like Tyler's like, your friends are fucked up. I've never heard a woman say that. Like there's no better line that it could just go to for one second and then come back and then it's all set. You're like, and oh, they, Jesus. They, they really do have to explain why Marla's there. Because yeah. why would any woman want to be around, especially, I mean, like, obviously she takes issue with a lot of things. She's trying to get to the root of it yeah. throughout the movie. She's trying to ask Edward Norton, like, the tough questions. Mm-hmm. Like, who are you talking to? Yeah. Like that type of stuff. But she's still not a sane person right. with her life together or anything. And so her reason for being there has to be explained as yeah. she is also a depraved kind of a bad person. Right. And I think we'll probably get into it more in scenes, but I'm one of the ones that kind of falls on the line that Marla isn't real. Either. Right. Right. And that's that's what I kind of my first line past like what the movie tells you is. Yeah. Is Marla real? Right. And then the second one is, are any of the people in Project Mayhem real? But the only thing that defeats that, and I guess we're just going to blur the lines a lot in yeah, this, in this, this is whatever. Gonna, this is a David Fincher fucking movie. We can't be hoo 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 segment by segment. We're going to fucking talk all day We're going to talk about, about the movie. But <laughs> the argument against that is people interact with Marla and the other people in Project Mayhem throughout the movie. Yeah. They are harassing people on the street. They're doing things in real right. life. That are being, you know, it could all be one huge delusion, and all of this is happening within Edward Norton's mind. Yeah. But it's hard to tell because they do make a, a clear line in the sand that nobody interacts with Tyler right. throughout the movie. You and if you pay attention to that the second time you watch it, third time you watch it, whatever, everybody only ever addresses Edward Norton, even when they're both together. They straight up walk through Tyler at certain points, like yeah. on the subway and stuff. They like there's somebody who's walking by and has their hand over the rail, and that's where Brad Pitt is standing, and walks straight over him, and it doesn't really bump him, and then bumps Edward Norton and says, excuse me. Yeah. Stuff like that. For me, I think the direct distinction is obviously clear, but I like the the idea that it is the ultimate choice of, like, he's created these two ideals of, like, his feminine and masculine side, and then at the end, ends up killing the masculine side and choosing his feminine side, and then in that last scene, he's, like, in a dress type deal or it like looks like he's in a dress okay there's like the whole theory there is that he's like you know is choosing like the more nurturing side of his split personalities which also does kind of highlight the line that tyler durden says where he says we're a generation of men raised by women exactly and i'm wondering if a woman is another woman is really the answer yeah it's like they're the devil and angel kind of but they're both obviously depraved but they like pit each other against each other like they're always like coming in in the room 
like in the scene where they're coming into the room at different times, they're like talking shit about each other to Edward Norton. Yeah. And then at the end, he like unravels and wants to undo everything Tyler's done and like, you know, confesses his actual feelings for Marla and like wants to get her out of trouble. Uh -huh. You know, so I don't know. That's like, but it's, it's, it's also that that does that's a huge theme in the movie is like the masculine versus the feminine yeah. because he's done so much and surrounds himself with all of these masculine energies mm -hmm. that then by the time he chooses his feminine, he's already done himself in yeah. because all of these masculine characters are around him. They're trying to undo his undoing. Yeah, <laughs> so he can't even do anything. Yeah. Like he can't he can't even save Marla if he wants no. to, and he wants to so bad, but he's done too much. Well, yeah, and he's told her so much already too. On the flip side, yeah, you know, what I mean, he's convinced her to partake to a degree. Yeah, touch on some more lines here before we really get into the scenes because I feel like that's where we're gonna sink our teeth in. Um, Tyler's great line of "Our great war is spirit." Spiritual and our great depression is our lives. Unbelievable line that really cuts. They, that, that's about being middle children. Middle children. We're they have God's nothing middle to fight. children. And it's like the, there were the wars before us and yep. the great depression. And we're now in this era where we haven't had wars. Mm -hmm. And so now our wars are within ourselves. Yeah. And that's, that is an awesome line. It is. <laughs> Um, I love when they are masqueraded as waiters and they hold down the big wig who's putting on like the whatever criminal investigation into Project Mayhem and they're all holding him down in the bathroom. I guess this goes into scenes too, but I, Tyler's lines of the people you are after are the people you depend on. We cook your food, we drive your car, we take care of your kids. Do not fuck with us. Yeah. Like, that is just a great line because it's like whatever. That's bourgeoisie versus the laborer. Yeah, and you get that line twice yeah because and and i love that is something that is so masterful about this is they reshoot scenes yeah and put them later where it's not tyler but it's edward norton yeah that is so cool because that's such an interesting shot to do yeah. where you have that angle on brad pitt's face where he's like do not fuck with us yeah and then it's edward norton doing the same thing dude this is Sick. like it'd been some years since i'd seen this and for some reason like whatever the aesthetic is so grimy and everything in my mind it was so much more like indie than what it actually is oh, yeah. like it's an it's such an incredible feat of sets and special effects from 99 that all just look amazing i think uh, uh all except for you don't like the penguin the what the penguin What's his that? emotional support penguin oh and i don't care about that okay. i'm saying all except for the explosions at the end yeah, I or, mean, oh, it is. I paid attention to it at this yeah. time. It is unbelievably bad compared to the rest <laughs> of the movie to the point where I have a theory about why. I okay. think it's on purpose. Yeah. I think it's supposed to look as fucking dumb as possible. Yeah. David Fincher said, like, after shooting seven, you know, a lot of the same people are working on this. He said, shooting this movie was like an absolute bear. I just felt like all we did was unload 40 trucks, shoot a 30 second scene and move to a different lot and unload 40 trucks and shoot a 10 second scene said shooting this whole movie just felt like trucks moving sets around. I think they built over 220 sets for this. Wow. Like insane. They just built, I mean the whole paper street house yeah. is like in century city back lot type deal. The ice cave there's is just ridiculous. I, I just, those things like slipped my mind completely. Yeah. A few more lines and then we'll get into scenes, which we yeah. just already dipped into, <laughs> whatever. but whatever. I love a scene where Edward Norton first meets up with Brad Pitt after meeting him on the plane. And it's where like his apartment exploded or yeah, whatever. They're, me they're meeting in Luz. Yeah. They're meeting in, at Luz and he's explaining all of the stuff that had happened. And then Brad Pitt responds, it could be worse. A woman could cut off your penis while you're sleeping and toss it out the window of a moving car. And he responds, eh, there's always that. <laughs> I also really love the whole conversation where the narrator's supervisor at work finds that printout of the fight club thing and comes mm -hmm. in. And then Edward Norton just like goes into this crazy yeah. monologue threatening essentially threatening to shoot up the office yeah. and other offices of his with a, an assault rifle. Yeah. It is so insane with modern context to hear somebody do that. It, it It's such a weird control, like a fight for control mm -hmm. thing, because then he uh, like eventually leverages that into just funding Project Mayhem with threats because yeah. he works for a car company and says he can just kind of like use all the information he knows. It's almost like the Marla thing. He realizes he's given too much information to Marla. Mm -hmm. He's like, this company I've worked for has given me too much information. I have too much power to hold yeah. over them where... If they were to take away my resources, 
all it would have to do is go tell the Department of Transportation about this and the whole company goes down. Yeah. And so I can leverage that to get what I want out of them. Yeah. But he does it in such a violent, threatening yeah, he way. He beats his own ass. Yeah, it's he awesome. does beat his own ass. So. All right, let's get into scenes since we're already talking about it. Um, some early scenes I really love. The Ikea catalog scene. Forgot all about that. I wrote that down too of like another Fincher trick. It's so cool. There's like five early Fincher trick scenes that I was just like, oh, like I didn't, that just don't register when you're younger. Like, yeah, I love when he's talking about when we explore deep space, there'll be all the corporate sponsorships and it's a shot like coming out of like his little pencil holder on his desk and it's showing all the labels and then it like pulls out onto him and it's just like, masterful all his little dropping down to the street level when the apartment blows up that like scene of the pilot light going on and everything blowing all up. the mechanics that happen yeah, yeah those yeah. mechanics are great and the then, sex dream scene yes is fucking crazy <laughs> and even the title sequence is like neurons and going through mm. the brain and stuff like really really crazy i'm going to stake my flag here and say this is fincher's best and i'll stake another one right next to it this is the greatest director of all time. Didn't we just get in an argument about this? He's he's the best. We just I literally said that, and you were like talking about Scorsese. And yeah, we got no, not fight. even close. I, I re, after rewatch it, this guy's the best. He's by he's the best. <laughs> yeah, this movie. There are no scenes that are worse. There are no scenes I would redo. There are no scenes that aged bad. It's he's the best, and this is his best movie. So maybe it makes it the best movie of all time. I'll say that <laughs> I'm not staking that flag. No, no, no. Okay, but I will stake that he is the best, and this is his best. Okay, um, let me just get into because Please. I don't want. I'm not saying that it's a perfect movie, and no. I'm also saying that there are scenes that have aged interestingly, and there that I have theories about those. Sure. So, like I said, the CGI explosions at the end, the buildings fall super fast. It's super weird, con considering all the other CGI in this movie. It's it's 99. I'm not expecting it to be perfect, yeah. but so much of it Pretty is good. so well done yeah. that it, I'm surprised at how bad the buildings exploding at the mm -hmm. end feels. And to me, that's why I had the theory that it 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 might be post death. Okay, yeah. Like, and I kind of debunked my own theory by looking into what the book, the ending of the book, is like, and well, yeah, all that totally stuff. Totally different in the it, book. Yeah, it's the the ending is the main difference between the book and the movie, yeah. which I'll get into. But to me, it feels like he's died, and in his death, his kind of like death hallucination is all of these things coming to light in front of him. And he's holding hands with Marla. Yeah. It's kind of like he gets both of what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He's watching the world crumble with Marla. So all of these, all of the Tylerisms that he's set to do and then tries to undo, those all happen. But he's still with Marla yeah. holding her hand and watching it happen. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of gets both out of it. And so to me, I'm like, is he just dead in that chair? And he's just imagining all of this. And that's why it's the hallucination is so unreal. Yeah. It's not supposed to look real because it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I thought. Because that's the main question there, too, is why does the shot kill Tyler and not the narrator? Like when he shoots himself in, in the mouth, yeah. Ty, the back of Tyler's head is blown out and he falls to the ground. And then Edward Norton is alive and like talking crazy and is bleeding out of his mouth. Obviously, he's not OK. Yeah, I don't he, think it happens. I think it's just like the symbolism for killing the part of himself. That's why I like tend to believe the philosophy of like he chooses the feminine over the masculine in himself. And that's like just the death of the one side of him. Yeah, but at the same time, like he does shoot himself with a gun. <laughs> yeah, duh, yeah. In the movie, that doesn't really, I, I guess it's hard to know what's real and what's not, right. but it seems like that's what he, that looks awesome, by the way, the way oh, Fincher does that, so the, the light in his mouth and yeah. then the, oh, it's crazy. But I mean, it's hard to watch, but it's fucking insane. Oh, I love it. I just think it's, it's interesting because it's like, it's hard to know why that works within the context. <laughs> yeah. Like what's the logic there? Yeah. I don't get it yeah. all the way that Tyler dies and the narrator lives. I think it's just making it like the movie version of it. So like to do that instead of just like 
shooting Tyler, he has to like, it does take a part of him or whatever to kill that part of him. Yeah. And I think that's just like exemplifying it. I don't think it like actually happens, but I think it's to show the viewer that it does like damage you to kill a part of yourself. Yeah. I'll just get to the book stuff. The movie takes most of the dialogue directly from the book, like I mentioned, but the characters and settings are different. Mm -hmm. So the narrator is supposed to be middle-aged with long stringy hair and Tyler Durden is supposed to be super manipulative and, and kind of hates the narrator. Yeah. So in the movie, he's a lot more friendly Mm -hmm. and like trying to protect the narrator. They're friends. And the other thing that is a random detail that got cut out is Marla is supposed to be storing her own mother's fat in the movie nice and then i think maybe that gets used for the soap or something i haven't read the book Mm -hmm. but that apparently was like a detail that some of the book readers were like that makes it more like she's involved yeah than than what actually happens in the movie and then also the narrator and tyler meet on a nude beach yeah in the book and not on a plane now like i mentioned the main difference is the ending because in the end of the book, the bomb malfunctions because Tyler mixed paraffin into the explosives. Uh And so still alive, holding Tyler's gun, the narrator puts the gun in his mouth and shoots himself. It's a non-fatal shot, just like it is in the movie. But he blacks out, wakes up in a mental hospital, believing he's in heaven, and imagines an argument with God over human nature. And that's how the movie, uh, the book ends. Yeah, it's very like clockwork orange in that way, mm-hmm. where they kind of switch the ending there. But also a big difference is like they do meet out on the nude beach in the book, and they don't like each other, as you said, in the book. But then Fincher kind of takes that intro of those characters in the book and like develops this whole like, homoerotic relationship in the film that isn't like laced as much throughout the book. Like he really makes them like the bathing scene when they're sitting there, like in a lot of ways, the narrator's in love with this version of himself. Uh And like, he loves how he has sex and he's like, he's like, I could go to the third floor where I wouldn't hear them, but he chooses to subject himself to it. Um, This leads to a very cheeky little scene that I love so much is when Edward Norton gets caught peeping and (laughs) Brad Pitt answers the door. Tyler answers the door. You want to finish her off? Well, that and he's naked and he's just wearing big work gloves. He has, I, I've never noticed it before. The frame cuts off like right here, but he's wearing like gardening gloves and he's just naked and he goes, what are you doing? And he goes, nothing, just going to bed. And he goes, you want to finish her off? And then on cue, she like falls off the bed and is like, ow! <laughs> and then she's like, who are you talking to? Yeah, that's a great, great scene. The gloves are just so funny. Yeah, that's funny. But yeah, I kind of, I don't know. That, that That's an interesting decision there. I don't see much like fight over that online between like, you know, book loyalists or movie loyalists. I think it's done well and it's kind of done, you know, in the time of like other strange psychopathic homoerotic themed movies like talented mr ripley and stuff Uh like you have these two personalities one being the others like ideal and while the others like in the process of becoming them they're like oh well maybe i don't need a woman maybe this is all i need and then they almost like cross that threshold and then it turns into hate and like disdain for that former ideal I can see that. I don't see it as very homoerotic in the movie. Like, it doesn't come across that way to me at all. It comes across, like, definitely, like... It comes across that Brad Pitt's hot, right? Yeah, I got picked up on that. Okay, Totally picked up on that. Yeah, 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 he's really hot. You know who else is hot is Edward Norton. Yeah, yeah, Ed's a little sexy guy. He's a good-looking guy. He's sexy, especially as a Nazi. (laughs) I was going to say, in American History X, he's very good-looking. He's obviously hard to like, except for (laughs) the very end of the movie, I guess. But Edward Norton also seemingly always has some kind of weird goth girlfriend in these movies, (laughs) you know, Uh, who's a bad influence. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of his thing. But yeah, uh, I didn't really see it as homoerotic as much as that classic, like bathing in the filth with your like grimy friend yeah. who you're phil- phil- philosophizing with. Like, yeah. it's very like broken down lifestyle. Like, of course, you don't care what you see yeah. or what you're around. You're like sweaty and gross all the time. Yeah. Type of guy. Leads into a couple other scenes. I love the scene when they're just, when he's finally like acclimated into living on paper street and they're hitting balls out in the front just yeah. into the darkness. He's like, there's no one around for miles. Me and Tyler like had the whole city to ourselves. And then it cuts to inside where Ed's just like sitting on the couch and Tyler's riding the bike around the house. Absolutely love that. They're just having a conversation as he goes room to room and his voice is changing as he's in different rooms. Yeah. It gives me 
brief little moments in that house remind me of our Lafayette house. Yeah, we had a we had a <laughs> we had a bit of a, a paper street situation going on. Yeah, we sure did. At one point, we had eight people living in there, and people were living in the attic and under the stairs, and it was fucked. <laughs> Some other subtle scenes I want to just shout out before we get too deep into it again. I love when Ed like first approaches Marla, and then they're like leaving the group. And she's just like on this mission and he's like trying to talk to her, like trying to devise a plan to where they don't have to see each other. They can split the groups or whatever. And she just walks into the laundromat, pops open a running machine, grabs a few things, throws it over, walks out. And he's like, you forgot half your clothes. And she's like, you know, just full steam ahead like she is. And then just goes right into like a thrift shop. And he's like, are you selling this? And then they have the conversation of like, no, you take brain cancer. Well, I want testicular cancer. No, yeah. I want blood parasites. And the, like the cashier is just in the fore background there. Yeah, he, awesome. He's scene. like you buried. She's like you buried the lead on that one. I know that's the one you want. Yeah. Like all that stuff. They're just fighting over which support groups they can go to so that they don't see each other yeah. because they hate each other. Yeah, that whole scene's great. And then as she's backing up through traffic once again, almost getting hit, careless for her own life. That's when Ed goes, "Hey, Marla, maybe we should exchange numbers." Maybe we want to switch days or something. And then she comes over and writes her number down. That's that. one of the main scenes where I, I think she's not real. Yeah. Is because, but traffic does stop for her a few yeah. different times. That's a tough one. But that's him too. Well, yeah, but he's not in the street yet. Multiple times. She she goes in front of traffic when he's not, he's on the side of the road. But there's the little montage where he's doing his work and, you know, he's flying around the single surveys. I'm here. And this is like the first face to face passing of Tyler like they're on the moving sidewalks in the airport yeah they kind of slip by each other and that's the line of like what if you like woke up somewhere and you were someone else yeah that happens and then you kind of get to see the dirty work of his job where he's going to all these crashes and he is getting like the breakdown of the malfunction and he explains his calculation but during that when they're in like the hangar looking at the burnt car and he's with like his two colleagues who are just like disgusting and like joking about all this like gross you know morbid shit mm. he's like see right there uh the braces got wrapped around the ashtray and melted to him during the crash would make a killer anti-smoking ad. <laughs> like that scene. And then like the dude in the front's like, yeah, see how the polyester melted with the fat and molded to like the suede seats? Kind of badass. <laughs> like, yeah. They are like just having a laugh, taking the piss out of the situation. That whole shit is really good. A scene I totally forgot about. Yeah. Um, that part where he passes Brad Pitt in the airport, mm -hmm. you know, there's a big fan theory about that scene. Go on. They say that's the real Brad Pitt. Oh, that he's just passing Brad Pitt. And then he, that's how he develops his hallucination. Right. He picks Brad Pitt He's because like, he wishes he could look like that guy. Yeah, but he sees him before. Like, at least on the cursory of the subconscious, he appears like four times before then. Right. There's a part where right. he passes it, whatever. That's funny, the first though. time he passes him, people say <laughs> that's that that's Brad the Pitt. real Brad Pitt. Yeah. And then he, like, thinks to himself, I wish I could be this. I wish I could be that. That's so funny. And that that's how he develops his yeah. hallucination to be him. And it's like, as much as the, our narrator is both these things, we do know him to be, like, the victim of materialism. And, like, he is heartbroken when the apartment blows up. He's like, I almost had it all. It was almost perfect. And he has the whole Ikea scene and everything. So that would make sense that he would idolize, you know, like the beautiful, super famous guy. Yeah. That's crazy. That reminds me of a line that I forgot where Tyler's talking to everybody at Fight Club. And he says, we've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'll be millionaires and movie <laughs> gods and rock stars, but we won't. And we're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And totally. I love that that's coming through. Ed Norton. Yeah. And also that when he says rock stars, he is literally passing Jared Leto as he says yeah. it. He's like saying it to Jared Leto, yeah. which is so funny. Yeah, it's awesome. It's funny that Jared Leto is in this movie. He's great in it. He's really good in it. Yeah. And But I will say one scene that I remember watching for the first time and to this day is hard for me to watch is him getting his fucking face blown up. Like, well, that was edited out of UK, Australia, Japan. Like that was the scene where they were like, nope, too gratuitous. That's going to like encourage antisocial behavior. Yeah. Type deal. Like that's, edited oh, out it of is, so many. it is so difficult to watch. I love it. I, I literally like had to look away. Multiple Cause that's times. got the line too. Well, that's got, that's a huge turning point in the movie. Cause like, that's like Ed foregoing our narrator foregoing like the sanctity of this thing. And he's crossing that line of like, 
It's not about like both of us reaching this primordial connection level thing. He's just delivering the punishment to a level of self gratification. And he leans back after he's done and he says, I wanted to breathe smoke. And it's like, Oh, he's crossed the line. He's yeah. lost it. And he also does breathe smoke at the yes. end of the movie, yes. which is fucking crazy. It, oh, dude, because that's like, all right, it's over. Like, whatever was good here, whatever male social club positivity that was happening is done. And everyone around him's like, right before that, too, like right before he says, I wanted to breathe smoke, he says, I wanted to shoot every panda between the eyes that wouldn't screw to save their species. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that doesn't even make sense. And that's fucking awesome. But it's just wild. A um, few more subtle scenes before I get into my absolute favorite scene in the movie. I love when <laughs> the line I forgot was when Marla calls Ed as like the neutral. She's not calling Tyler and she goes, my breasts are going to fall off. <laughs> I like, I need you to come check me for lumps. Yeah. And then she says like, she's about to OD and she's like pleading for help, whatever. And then Tyler picks up the phone. We learn this kind of later on. That's how they meet. Yeah. Like he picks up the hanging phone. But when it goes to that scene, when Tyler shows up at Marlo's apartment, they're there for a second. They're about to hook up. She slips off the bed and she's like, you slippery plastic sheets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's the cock on the table and that he like bumps and she goes, don't be threatened by him. <laughs> oh, yeah, Don't worry. He's not a threat. To yeah. You. He's not a threat to you. And then the cops show up and she's like, oh no, someone called the cops. And then they're, they bust out into the hallway and Brad Pitt does the classic pull her down the side hall and Brad Pitt starts going yeah. as if they're like tweakers, just like hook it up. Yeah. And then Marla goes fully into character and is like, it's down there. She hates herself. Yeah. She's a disgusting woman. Like she, she's awful. She's given up her will to live. Yeah. And like, she's doing so much extra. Good like, luck trying to reason with her. Yeah. Brad Pitt's like pulling her in the, into the elevator and she's like, good luck. Her name's Marla Singer. Disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. That whole little performance is like just amazing. Yeah. I she's great. It. Yeah. I absolutely love that scene. And then uh, the starting fights with strangers scene mm -hmm. is another little one I kind of forgot about because that one's like we're taking the philosophy outside of the basement. We're starting to bring it into the real world. And just the hose scene. Yeah. Hits him with the hose. And the guy goes, hey, what the hits him again? He goes, this is not necessary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. <laughs> and then, yeah, the projector porn, the children scene, the second of porn. Oh, in yeah. The theater is just crazy. You got a favorite scene in this movie? Is it the chemical burn? I think it's probably the chemical burn. That it's, one's really close. Yeah, that one's my favorite, I think. I love the hysteria that takes place when Lou, gangster Lou, comes down to the basement. It's like, what the fuck's going on here? Actually, I did. I forgot. That's a huge qualm I have with this movie, though. Why? Okay, Tyler is supposed to be Edward Norton, yeah. obviously. That's the thing. But during that scene, Lou comes down there. And then Lou starts beating up like Tyler's like hit me. Tell he's like he's like I don't think I got it yet. I don't get the message. Love whatever. It. And then he gets covered in blood and he's spitting blood into Lou's face. And then Lou says they can use the basement yeah. and leaves. The next scene, Edward Norton is fresh face talking to Marla. Completely fine. Who got their face beat in by Lou? Yeah. It's supposed to be the next day. That's what they like. Who? Yeah. I don't know. That shit pisses me off. That's actually. my favorite scene in the whole movie. Yeah. He, oh, dude. Because he's it's just, disgusting too. Yeah, he gets hysterical and he's like egging him on. He doesn't understand it, and then he just Lou thinks he's been the tough guy, proving the point. But like these guys are like sadists, and he holds him down, opens his mouth, and drips blood in his face. And like, oh, it's I don't know. I absolutely love that scene. One more I want to shout out. Oh my god, <laughs> Project Mayhem starts holds up the shop owner. He's got the gun to him in yeah. the back. What did you want to be in life? He's like a veterinarian. Oh yeah, like, I do. I do love that scene. And he's like, if you're not on your way to becoming the person you dreamed of becoming, <laughs> six in weeks, six weeks, you will be dead. Yeah. And then he just like kicks him and sends him off. He's like, we're gonna keep track of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shit, dude. Yeah. What what a scene. And then and then I love that Ed kind of takes issue with that. Yeah. And then he's like he's like he's gonna have the best breakfast of his life tomorrow morning because he's right. alive. Like he, it's a very it's fucked up. It's not the right way to think about no. life or whatever but he i do love that there is a character like that yeah me too who is just like a normal person yeah who's cowering in fear <laughs> as a gun's held to their head and then is just kind of like forced to follow his yeah. dreams you know <laughs> all right let's let's see if it would be different today all right 
tell you what, if it came out two years later, it wouldn't have had the building explosions slash terrorism conversations. Yeah, and this movie got delayed on release because of uh, Columbine. Yeah, yeah, so that makes sense. They were like, it was going to come out like the month after Columbine, but then it would have had to have some dialogue changes like the scene in the office that you talked about. Yeah. But then they just pushed it, pushed it also with the ad campaign. They didn't know how to advertise it or market it to people, but yeah. Yeah. I guess it would be different because like we'd have a lot of these larger corporations and more modern like businesses to like really fixate on. Like this one like fixates on like the the corporate coffee shop. That yep. was like taking over the corner coffee shop at the time. Today, we have bigger targets. We have Uber. We have Amazon. They would be going at like OnlyFans pornography and this kind of thing. But yeah, I think generally the sentiment, like the movie can stay the same. It's fine because corporate coffee shops still suck. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the sentiment would remain the same. Yeah. It's kind of one of those movies that's like, it, it's about what it's about. Yeah. So it would be the same no matter when you make it. Totally. This one, like we said, so hard to recast because I can't imagine anyone else in these roles at all. Yeah. I do like the shouts of the people that they talked about being in it. Like I could, I can understand a Sean Penn or I guess a Matt Damon and Russell Crowe's an interesting shout in the 90s yeah, for that. For sure. But uh, I said Michael Sarah as the narrator, uh, The Rock as Tyler Durden, Aubrey Plaza as Marla. And instead of Jared Leto, it's Machine Gun Kelly. <laughs> And then it's a terrible movie. That's the oh. that's my <laughs> recast for it being a really really bad movie. I just said all girls. It's about chick stuff. Chicks. And then Marlo would be like Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, yeah, like a I slutty little skinny freaky depraved sex boy. Yeah, I could see and that. It's about like struggling to find the female identity in mm. the modern society. Mm -hmm. You know, I the think, bottoms. Yeah, but less gay. Yeah, and this less movie is also. Pretty gay. Well, it's kind of, yeah. Yeah. There are theories that it's kind of about somebody with gender dysphoria. Yeah. So it's kind of like somebody feeling forced to identify their masculine and, yeah. and hyper be hyper masculine and then kind of realizing their femininity and leaning into that, that Marla is more of a representation mm -hmm. of the narrator than Tyler Durden is all of those things. And I, I can see how that would be. I'm not sure that that was the yeah. point of the movie, but I can see how it adapts to that narrative. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, this movie, you can't they, recast it. Edward if, Norton like is that character. If they ever made a sequel, it would be such an injustice to this movie. Yeah. Unless Fincher did it or something. And unless Brad Pitt came back and did Tyler again yeah. for someone else. And he looks the same, basically, so he could probably he could do it. Yeah. yeah, he could probably do it. Um, I had something else to say about recast, but I don't even really care to say it, you know, because it shouldn't ever, shouldn't happen. Helena Bonham Carter is perfect as Marla. I can't even believe it. Yeah, I can't believe she didn't win everything for this. Yeah. It's fucked up. I also want to quickly shout out the PS2 video game. I played the fuck out of that. I didn't know there was one. It was awesome. It was just kind of like a side scroller fighter. You could be Jared Leto. You could be Bob. You had like, I think there's like four or five settings. You know, you could fight and lose. You could fight in the garden. Yeah. You could fight uh, at the soap place or at the fat factory or whatever, yeah. uh, the lipo factory. And then, then you just kind of like fought them and everybody had their special moves. Bob could like bash you with the boobies. Yeah. Uh, Brad Pitt could like burn you with a cigarette or something. It mm. was awesome. It was a great fight because it's so gory. Like they really leaned into it. Like all the other fighters of that era, Tekken and stuff were very cartoonish. Street fighter. And, yeah, yeah. And this was like bashing brains out. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great game. Like we said, it's the production duo of Dust Brothers and then most famously, the Pixies. Where's yeah. my mind? Where's my mind? Yeah. Is at the climax or at the final scene, which is it's a pretty baller choice. It's yeah, it is the Fight Club song. And it makes me like that scene, despite that being the scene I have the most qualms with, sure. like, you know, the CGI and kind of like, is it real or like, does he survive? Why is Tyler? All that stuff that I said before. But that song not only is it like a great song i love that song yeah. but it's such a weird choice that it feels iconic because it's so different from what everything else that happens in the rest of the movie it's the yeah. first like rock song with words yeah. that you get and it's like a song that's known not just for this movie it feels like curtains yeah like when that song hits it's like okay it's done the story's done. It gets brighter. There's yeah. melody. We've like taken the step back from like, because the narrator has such a grip on you. Like there's not really any room in this movie to even like, if you like look away, grab something, tune out for a second, like there's constant dialogue narration being explained to you. And that song, and you're like kind of relieved 
from the stranglehold the narrators had on you and like stumbling into that madness and it backs up, everything blows up. Perfect. Oh uh, yeah. And <laughs> so, one last note I'll say is not even about the soundtrack necessarily, but like the Safdie brothers have to love this movie. Yeah. Because there's so much of like the pacing and the yeah. things that they do in Safdie Brothers movie, which some of those are like good times, one of my favorite movies ever. Yeah. You know, I love Uncut Gems as well, but it's like you can tell that anxiety thing. Yeah. And and kind of letting it like release at the end. And it's not a happy ending. Right. This movie's not a happy ending, but it is a release from the stress. The anxiety yeah. is like He's the king of last scenes. Yeah. Like he like seven. Yeah. Gone Girl. Yeah. Like it's the same scene as the first scene. Like he's just like, it's masterful curtains moments with him that are like, oh shit. Yeah. Did it again. I mean, if you can't tell by how much we've rambled about this, <laughs> yeah, obviously I recommend it. I mean, it's, I really hope you didn't watch this and not know the end of the movie. I, I like, yeah. you know, I don't think you would have, but I also like, I'm, yeah, it's still, fine. you're going to like fine. it either way, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I wish I could watch this movie for the first time again, yeah, having it's not those, known. It's, it sure. really is one of those. Uh, five stars. I wish someone would beat the shit out of me. I'll also give it five stars. And I, I wrote, watch this with my roommate, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I read it. I read it when it was on your doc, and I was like, what? And then I was like, oh, oh was he there? <laughs> I'm not sure because he is kind of the manifestation of all the Perfection. things I wish I could be, yeah, you Perfection. know, is that guy. So yeah. shout out to Hunter. Shout out Hunter. And uh, yeah, this first is first five stars. First five stars. And it's a double five star. So I hope you guys like this. I hope you guys wa have seen Fight Club or you go watch it because you see how much we love it. I hope you want us to watch the rest of David Fincher's filmography because we can just start that tomorrow or yeah, something. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Uh, if you want to know what movie we're watching ahead of time for this series, join our Patreon. It's only $5 a month, or you can become a member on the main channel, Hivemind. And this has been Hivemind Unlimited. This has been How Did It Age? Fight Club, 1999. Thank you so much for watching with us. Have a great one. Oh, maybe they should redo it like in the 30s. And he's like, hey, come here, come here, come here. I know we got a great war to fight, but I'd rather fight you. <laughs> See you. See you.